Welcome to the Bestiary, where every episode we examine another monster from the Dungeons and Dragons Monster Manual. Join us at Alignment May Vary on Twitch, or listen to our podcast, which comes out a week later, on alignmentmayvary.com. Ask and get your questions answered on our Facebook page, or by sending us an email to alignmentmayvary at gmail.com. Enjoy the show. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the best Sierra. Don't worry, you guys were muted. <laughs> my name is Morgan, and I'll be hosting today. I'm running the Twitch side of things, and I will unmute my co-hosts here so you can say hi to Jonathan as well. Unmuted! Unmuted! And Tyler. Hello. And our wonderful guest, Owen Casey Stevens, and I believe Jonathan. Hi, folks. Unless Owen wants to introduce himself, I believe Jonathan has a very well-scripted introduction ready. I would be honored to to introduce um, Owen Casey Stevens. Um, and Owen has been working in the field of game design since... Actually, help me out with this one. How long have you been in game design, Owen? Uh, I believe we're at 20 mumble mumble years now. That's awesome. In that time, he's worked on a huge variety of projects and titles, from Dungeons and Dragons to the Black Company and Dragon Age RPGs, and many, many more. Um, I personally first discovered his work through Green, and I probably pronounce it wrong. I say Green Ronin, but I've heard you say Green Ronin. That is the correct pronunciation of that company name. Love it. I'm, I'm already learning stuff tonight. Um, so I first discovered his work through Green Ronin Publishing when he worked on the Advanced Bestiary. Uh, but one of the things I like most about Owen is the extensive blog he keeps, where he goes into incredible details about his design process, um, about the work that goes into making products for RPGs, and just in general RPG discussions. It's kind of like a free classroom for aspiring RPG writers. And I thank you, Owen, so much for putting in the effort of keeping it up. Thank you very much. His latest project uh, is the awesome 52 in 52 bundle, which will give you a new RPG product every week for the entire year of 2020. And it's important to note these are going to come out. Um, every product will be built for a variety of systems. So it, I think it's Pathfinder, Pathfinder 2nd Edition, 5th Edition. Am I forgetting any? Starfinder, which is in many ways conceptually the odd man out, but since I was one of the, the design leads for the Starfinder role-playing game, I just can't leave my baby behind. And um, going off of that, Owen, could you tell us a little bit about what products will be included in that and which you want us to be most excited for? Sure. So um, 52 and 52, uh, we're trying to sort of build things so that there's a theme each month. Uh, so for example, we're going to be doing a system called Into the Breach, which will be mass combat rules for all those game systems. Uh, and the products leading up to that in that month will be things like warband stat blocks, if you just want to have one warband and run it as a monster and make it quick and simple, or um, siege weapons, if you want to have... Or we've got something that we're calling Darnit's Straw Tower, which is, is magical strongholds. And so those are thematically linked to the warfare concept that Into the Breach will then do a large version of. Uh, we're trying to hit a broad range of different things because it's 52 products. Uh, we we want we want everyone looking at that to find enough stuff that excites them that they want to buy the whole program. Because at least for 2020, we're not going to sell any of, any of these individually. So you buy into the whole program. Uh, if you don't buy in until June, you'll get everything we've done up to that point uh, and everything towards the end of the year. Right now, it's in pre-order so it's 29.95 uh there's a link i'm sure um we have a catalog a free catalog that you can find uh on the open gaming store or for that matter at rogue genius games on uh one bookshelf which is drive through rpg uh which shows all the titles and one sentence descriptions and most of the covers <clears throat> um we have classes we're going to do. I, earlier this year, I, I spent a lot of time on social media asking people, if I could write anything for one of these game systems, what would you most like to see? So there are people that want an Artificer. There are people that want a Runeblade system. Uh, there are people that want uh, Magic Girls as a campaign. There are people that want <laughs> Mecha Rules. Uh, there are people that want... I, I had a request for a Headless playable ancestry so in october <laughs> we will be releasing the headless for all those four systems so that you can play a person 
who got too excited and lost their head. And if you go look at the cover, uh, my layout artist had a lot of fun with it because we've got a headless Horbison figure, but the H in the word headless has also been severed and is falling off the rest of the title. <laughs> Nice. Um, so some are going to be uh, sillier, right? We're, we're going to do uh, Teens Solving Mysteries, TSM, as a campaign setting, and Rut Row, the campaign for the, the rules for <laughs> talking animal ancestries. Uh, but we're also going to do things like Hellblood Magic, where we talk about how you, you access the magic inherent to fiendish entities' blood, uh, or brands and sigils and old wounds are marked by a, a devilish sign. There's a lot lot of content that we're putting together and our hope is that we'll we had the hope is that we found a new way for an independent creative to connect with an audience one of the most difficult things when you're not a great big company is to get people to find your stuff and if i release 52 individual products over the course of a year i have to try and find an audience 52 times and that every time at a convention there'll be someone who says oh i really wish there's a book that had rules for uh, how someone's name might have an actual game mechanical effect uh, on their character. And I'm like, well, I wrote that product. It's for sale right now. Oh, I never saw it. <laughs> well, I, I know you never saw it. Or, you know, I really wish there was a, a line of products that took Pathfinder classes and broke them down so I could build exactly the kind of fighter I want. It's called the Talented Fighter. It's been out for four years. Uh, people just don't find these things. So part of the drive here is that if we have this one bundle that we're selling for one price, this one program, then if you're interested in any set of things in it for any of the game systems in it, you can buy it and get everything. So the hope is if you're only excited about uh, teen solving mysteries and adventure Academy and the magic girls campaign setting, those things are worth the amount that we're going to be charging for the whole package. If you're only interested in five, fifth edition, we will give you that. So this is how everybody, you come out, you find the rut row blood magic. Uh, exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't realize I wanted you know, a I, I vote magical girl campaign, John, just, just this so you moment. know. Okay, very well. When we do our transition campaign, we'll make it, we'll, yes. we'll make it the magical girls. <laughs> I I'm, can't wait to see Tyler as a magical girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, we're not going to have any gender requirements on magic girls. So if Tyler wants to be a magic girl, he is welcome to be one. That's yeah. No, no. In my game, in my game, everybody's got to be a girl. In my I game, am more than happy <laughs> to play a magical girl. Well, no, that's, that's house rules and you're welcome to do what you want in that regard, but we're not building it into the system. <laughs> Wait, can I be a magical girl? That's a dude. Wait, like the sailor stars. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, what are the Power Rangers except Magic Girls, not all of oh, whom happen to be girls, right? You're it's right. It's definitely yeah. the same space. Yeah. Well, today, um, I didn't know we were going to talk about the Power Rangers as Magical Girls, but I did know we were going to talk about a specific kind of monster. Today, we are here to talk about the legendary, the one, the only, the Beholder. Casey or, or Owen, sorry, would you would you do us the honor of giving us a description of the Beholder? Sure. So, and one of the fun things about the Beholder is that if you want to describe all of them, you've got to get really, really loose with your description. Um, in the loosest sense, a Beholder is a big orb with a central eye and a bunch of eye stalks coming off of it, which floats around and commits evil. Um, the thing that fascinates, and, and it is so iconic that, as was just pointed out on your stream, your your bestiary logo has what is pretty clearly a beholder on your your book icon. Um, Very one true. Of the things, one of the things I think that makes the beholder so fascinating and so much fun is that it is one of the only D and D monsters, and in fact, strains of monsters that was created whole cloth for D and D. There is no mythological equivalent. Uh, it is not unlike the Displacer Beast. It isn't taken from an old pulp science fiction right. novel. Uh, it's not based on on giants or mythology or, or Tolkien or Moorcock. Um, it is something that was just created purely for D and D. It's not even. There are things like the the Bullet and the Rust Monster, which were created because. Uh, some of the early players had a set of little plastic toys from Japan that came in little bubbles from quarter machines, and they just made things up for that. But the Beholder... That's the same set the Owlbear came from, correct? Right, exactly. Owlbear comes from the same set. Uh, but the Beholder is just something that Rob Kunz's brother Terry came up with. He had the basic idea, and then Gary Gygax wrote it up for publication. 
Now, interestingly, I've read an interview with um, Rob Kuntz about about Terry's original Beholder. Maybe maybe you can shed this li- some light on this. Uh-huh. I've read that the original version was actually uh, this kind of misunderstood thing, kind of like a Bigfoot or a Yeti. It lived in a family unit and it hid from the world because it was discriminated against. And it, how much do you know about that? I actually don't know a lot about that. And that is kind of endemic of a lot of this early D&D lore, right? There's a lot of stuff that at this point, uh, I mean, at this point, if Rob Kuntz says that's the case, I completely believe him uh, because he was there and we weren't. But a lot of this stuff just didn't get written down, right? So I get my information mostly from old interviews from Gygax and then from talking to people like uh, Jeff Grubb, uh, who was in there in those really early days and and not not at the very beginning, but as the Beholder evolved. Um, but it would not surprise me in the least, right? That's exactly the sort of thing that happens when you're talking about publishing a monster is that frequently someone has a cool idea and you use it. And then you're thinking to yourself, well, okay, but how do we end up making this more generally useful? Because if what you have is a misunderstood creature that's hiding from humanity, that's not useful in as broad a series of typical D&D like encounters and campaigns uh, as a horrific monster that can neutralize magic that has an anti-magic ray and I really think that anti-magic ray is one of the things that made the beholder it's like the wizard version of the rust monster right there there are two things that have always (laughs) struck fear in the hearts of some set of players anyone that has armor and a weapon is afraid of the rust monster anyone that casts spells is afraid of the beholder and this is probably a good point for those who don't play uh, D&D, um, who are listening to our, our show. Um, the, the Beholder, so you know, all, each of the eyes that come out of the Beholder has a different power. Uh, and they've stayed pretty consistent throughout the years. Some of the most famous ones are the Death Ray or the Disintegration Ray, the Telekinesis Ray. They kind of do what they say on the package. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no subtlety there. But the giant eye in the middle tends to uh, shoot forth this anti-magic cone, which all magic done in front of it or wherever the cone is pointed is disrupted. It doesn't work. So levitating characters will suddenly fall 400 feet to their death. The wizard shields, the cleric's healing, none of it works. And as um, Owen points out, that's the wizard was the was really the big guns of the party in in early D and D. I mean, that was like the, the one thing the DM didn't have an answer for until this thing came along. And, and all those rays do a lot of the things that, that player character casters did to the, the G, D, DM's monsters, right? All of those nasty things. Hey, I use telekinesis and I, I drop one of the elephants on another elephant, or I just cast a, a disintegration <laughs> spell. Um, so, all of that stuff the beholder has that it gets to throw back at you. And I think it's really fascinating has how it's evolved over the years because that that first edition or, or basic beholder um, was was pretty much a, a scab with eyes. It wasn't all that frightening. Um, but uh, when they did uh, Waterdeep in the North, which was a, a book that had the beholder crime lord Xanathar, and I know a lot of people don't know that Xanathar – is a beholder. Uh, some people do, but of course, Xanathar's Guide to Everything is out. And oh, so and can you is, can you give a brief um, description of Xanathar just for the people that don't uh, know D and D as well? Uh, so Xanathar is a crime lord um, who who and and it's it's the Xanathar. So whoever is the crime lord of of that crime family uh, is the Xanathar. And early on, at least, people didn't even in in the Forgotten Realms did not realize that Xanathar was a beholder. So it's a crime lord who is a beholder, and that's that fascinating moment where up till then, mostly when beholders were used in D&D stories, they were a sack of hit points and spells and an anti-magic ray, right? It's room 15, there's a beholder here, and it tries to kill you. Um, Xanathar is is the godfather, but also a horrific aberration with an anti-magic cone and a bunch of rays. And a pet goldfish, by the way. He also has a pet goldfish. <laughs> was was that sort of like with the drow, where for a long time the Xanathar was just kind of an unknown quantity, and then a campaign was released where it was like, psych, it's actually a terrifying beholder. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and so Keith Parkinson did a piece of art uh, for Xanathar, for the, the crime lord, on Waterdeep and the North, 
and he was the first person to to draw it with the armored like plates uh, and give it jointed anthropod like eye stocks. Uh, Interesting. And so that is that moment. And uh, Jeff Grubb was working on those products, and so Jeff Grubb saw that and thought, "Oh, neat! This is obviously a beholder, but it's a very different looking beholder." So when he started working on Spelljammer, he wanted there to be beholders as one of the major forces in Spelljammer, but have it be a lot of different types of beholder because he really liked that Xanathar illustration. So that is one of the places where they really started to to break out. And he was doing Spelljammer starship art with Jim Holloway, another great artist. Uh, and he asked Jim Holloway for beholder starships. And Jim Holloway drew him a bunch of different ideas. And instead of picking one and saying, that's a beholder, uh, Jeff Grubb said, okay, we're going to use all of these. And these are all for different subcategories of beholders. And the beholders themselves hate different subcategories of beholders. And so the entire idea of them being a, a xenophobic race that hates everyone, even other variants of themselves, comes from Jeff playing with the art, which you can trace back um, from Jim Holloway uh, to Keith Parkinson, all the way back to the the original first few things. And so every time a new edition of D&D is released, they've looked at what do we want our Beholder to look like now, but they've also intentionally taken it in other places. Uh, I did, uh, for fourth edition, I wrote up some of the Monster Manual 2 Beholders, and there was like a fiery eye and an icy eye, uh, which were sort of simplified Beholders, and instead of having 27 different things, had like two. Um, but they had different looks that was, again, drawn from that idea that there are subspecies, which, when you think about, like, dogs as an example right you can look at a great dane and a chihuahua and it's hard to believe that those two things are more closely related than a tiger and a lion but it's true um i, I think beholders are one of the places where we've had this reinforcing cycle of oh this is cool people like it let's do more variants of it oh people like those variants well now we're going to make the fact there are variants part of the entire species okay well that makes it cool again and so it's 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 sort of become one of those monsters that can be all things to all people, like dragons. Um, vampires, yes, there are a bunch of different kinds of vampires, Asian vampires, etc., but they all tend to look roughly the same. But beholders and dragons and some of the other really classic monsters have radically different looks. But as long as it's got that orb feeling, that central look, big toothy mouth and a bunch of eye stocks, you immediately know, oh, that's a beholder. It has become iconic. You point... You point out something interesting there because um, it, it, I have I have looked at the huge variety of, of variants, and we won't go too much into variants tonight, just because we'd be here forever. <laughs> there's there's literally dozens of variants. I feel like of the that's beholder. its own episode, right? Beholderkin. <laughs> it, beholderkin has got to be its own episode. But I will say, I, I just going off of what you were saying, Owen. Um, two of the forms that, that like some of the forms had, um, legs and some of them were like these, like, I think it's the overseers uh -huh. who are these tree looking things with eyes coming out. And, and I have not seen those be as popular as the floating eye. So I think you're right. There's something about that floating eye thing that. Yeah. Really even even the the eye of the deep, right. Which just has claws. It, it does show up, but it's just not as popular. Um, I, I think. I think some of it is that it looks like a head. It looks like a skull. Um, it has a face. And as as people that tend to anthropomorphize things, seeing, okay, it's got a central eye, it's got some little eyes, then it's got a mouth. So it can smile, it can grimace, it can talk. Those are things that make a monster relatable to players and, and GMs both, right? If we're talking about a, a giant tree that happens to have some eyes as a GM, I don't, well, maybe I do, but I'm a weirdo. Most GMs <laughs> do not immediately think to themselves, okay, that's going to have a conversation and it's got goals and it, it has things it wants to do. But when you look at beholder art, I at least frequently get a sense of the personality of that beholder. This beholder is angry. That beholder is confused. This, this beholder is whispering dark secrets. Um, and I think it makes people want to play with them. And the fact there are so many variants means that GMs feel empowered to change them to match their needs. Tyler, Morgan, I want to throw a question your way real quick, uh, again, based off of what Owen was saying. What, what do you get when you look at a beholder? What, what do, you, do you get that personality sense or what, what do you feel when you look at one? Yeah, I always – it's like the quintessential 
dungeon monster. Whenever I look at it, it just, uh, like, it's the creepy thing you're going to find in the dark somewhere. It was actually the first Dungeons and Dragons monster I ever saw in a comic book ad for the Eye of the Beholder video game. It's iconic, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think it is very closely tied to d and I mean, I only started playing with you guys recently. I mean, recently, three years ago. But um, before that, I hadn't had much exposure to, you know, the the tabletop gaming aspect of it. But even even I was like, oh, yeah, that's a beholder. I don't know where I absorbed that from or like I, I knew <laughs> nothing about it other than I could identify it on a piece of paper. But um, I don't know. I, I look at him and I just have a huge resounding gut instinct of nope. <laughs> And, and Owen, what was your first encounter with a Beholder? Uh, my very first encounter with a Beholder was when I was in my mid-teens, and uh, we were uh, and and we were young, not nosed teens, and we had read uh, the the Monster Manual front and back, and our GM knew we had read the Monster Manual front and back, so we were going through a dungeon, and there were spores in the air and there were mushrooms on the walls and so when we saw this big floating orb up ahead of us we were 100 percent convinced oh that's a gas spore that's not a beholder we're too low level the gm wouldn't possibly throw a beholder at us <laughs> <clears throat> um about that wh- whereas the gm had been reading the monster manual and saw that the beholder was a super genius and that there were things called gas spores that you never wanted to attack or they'd pop and infect you so that beholder had lined its layer with a whole bunch of mold spores and fungi and things that didn't bother it at all so that people would think it was a gas spore. So it just sat there as we wandered around, didn't move, didn't talk, and waited for us to all stand over the wall of force with dirt over it, over the pit trap. And then it turned its anti-magic cone onto the wall of force over the pit trap, which we were all standing on. And then we fell through it 300 feet to our death in the pit trap. <laughs> so that, wow. that was my first introduction to beholders. Um, and one of the oh. things that I took away from that was that that set of abilities allows a super genius beholder to have a very different set of tactics and defenses than any normal human. And that I think is part of its, uh, uh, Morgan was talking about how she noped when she first saw it. I think that's another reason why it is so iconic and that you can see that and immediately think that does not put its pants on one pant leg in the morning. Like I do, right. <laughs> and most of them don't wear pants at all. Or if they do, it's got to stick to eye stocks through it. And by the way, would that even work? Um, it, 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 it is clearly alien and different and disturbing. And I think GMs have a lot of fun with that. One of my early uh, campaigns that I ran, I had beholders as a, a major strain of villains, but I carefully told my players, um, The thought process of a beholder is so alien that even I, as the GM, cannot predict their tactics. As a result, I have created a random table for what the Uh. beholder will do and who it will target every round. And this makes perfect sense to the beholder, but I'm telling you that I will be randomly determining their actions. And as a result, players were terrified because they knew there was no telling what these alien creatures would do. No logic, no attempt to fake them out, no putting the fighter up and putting all the defensive spells on him and making it the biggest threat. No, it's not even me being mean and targeting the healer and back. If it targets the healer and back, the beholder just decided that made sense. And, you know, with the 11 eye stocks and the big anti-magic and the the possibility of a bite, uh, you really could have some really random fights where a beholder might just chew someone to death and you've wasted all your defenses trying to make sure that your saving throws would prevent you from being turned to water and dribbling away. Or you could have one where the beholder sees you, turns one guy to stone, and then flees because escape was one of the things on my table. Uh, and that played well to the alienness of them. And I really think that that is part of what makes them so popular and and so persistent, right? They're one of the very few monsters that was in the Dungeons and Dragons movie, for example. They're on screen for two seconds, but they're there. Uh, and, and they're one of the few ones that's actually copyrighted. Yes. Um, although how defensible that is is another question entirely, right? They show up. And anime all the time. There are Final that Fantasy. Are, there are things that are very clearly beholders in World They're of in Warcraft. Futurama. Futurama can probably claim it's a parody, right? Parody has always been a strong defense. Yeah. 
Um, and Futurama can pretty much say anything they do as a parody. How do you know it's a parody? <laughs> it's on Futurama. Um, That's little, how Rick and Morty gets away with stuff too, yeah. Well, also, I mean, Rick and Morty just had a D&D set released, right? So right. there's also the, we are so popular that you don't want to sue us because we make your thing look cool. You want to pay uh, us instead. <laughs> you know, d- d- McDonald's pr- probably could have gone after Rick and Morty for mentioning McDonald's and the Szechuan sauce, but instead they had a special that drove tens of thousands of fans to go crazy and buy chicken nuggets so they could get Szechuan sauce, which no one had cared about for more than a decade. Smart, smart marketing. I do want to see the Beholder McDonald's toy. It's cuddly and affectionate. I feel like that is a definite choking hazard. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, what you do for that is you just have the cardboard box that holds the Big Mac be a square-sided Beholder. (laughs) <laughs> oh, with pop out eye stocks. There you go. I, I like well, you, that. You little holes so you can stick your fries in the top to be eye stocks. <laughs> That's genius. We should market this to uh, fast food companies. <laughs> well, I mean, Wendy's has a role playing game now, so that yes, might, in fact, yes. be a viable marketing venue. So does so does KFC. Well, and KFC has a romance novel. Yep. So, the world is upside down. So I, so I know that Tyler and I are kind of resisting the urge to talk about our recent encounter um, with the Beholder, in which John got to play in the sandbox the, a little the bit. The Psy Beholder. <laughs> the, the completely metal space Beholder. <laughs> we're, we're kind of going through a little bit of a Spelljammer-esque scenario in our game right now. And I, I realized after running, we, we had a Cyber Holder who participated in a... <laughs> <laughs> in a Mario Kart style race. Um, and uh, I realized that was my first Beholder. I haven't, I haven't actually GM'd a Beholder before. And I think part of that is because kind of what you were talking about, Owen, I, it is a, I feel like it's an incredibly difficult monster, not to run mechanically, but to run mentally and to do justice to. Um, one of the things we have, we've only kind of touched on uh, for our listeners is beholders, a big part of their culture is extreme paranoia. And, and I have to lay this out in the sense of um, they will, they literally believe that anything that's not them is not right in the world. The, the, the beholder kin are not perfect. The beholder is perfect. The one, the only. He's got it right. Every other beholder's got it wrong. And everything else, by the way, wants to kill them, is how they think. I I, I thought it was fascinating. One of the things I found was uh, one of the variants on uh, how they reproduce when their, you know, spawn Now, come before out. you go into this, Tyler, I do have to say, if you're going to go into the mouth stuff, I'm not going to go into the mouth stuff. Okay, because I'm going to save that. For, I have a section to... about the mouth stuff. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, the mouth stuff. This is some foreshadowing, some mouth stuff. But go ahead, go ahead, um, go on. <laughs> it, like, picks the one, the, like, few that look closest to it and eats the rest and drives the other ones away because eventually the slight differences between it and its you know, brood of slightly similar beholders will drive it so crazy it will try to kill them. That's that's good motherhood there. Well, I mean, that's built in survival of the fittest, mm-hmm. right? Well, and it, this is kind of one of the things you mentioned this, Owen, the beholders have gone through actually, um, maybe not visually so much, but a ton of changes throughout the years um, in terms of their history and lore. Like, yeah. in all the monsters that we've done for the bestiary, I've never found one that the various articles throughout the years, usually they build on each other. They say, oh, well, so-and-so, Ed Greenwood said this in an ecology article, so we're going to take that and develop it. Here are the articles straight up just disagree, throw out major stuff from the old ones. I mean, for example, the flo- the way they float, right? This was originally, um, Ed Greenwood said it was a levator magnus, which was an organ in the brain of the beholder. Well, by the time you get to lore, um, to uh, I Tyrant, which is only an addition later, yep. uh, it's a special kind of gas called Tyusium. And then you get to uh, a third edition, Lords of Madness, and they just kind of don't talk about it. They're like, eh, we oh, don't know how it no. happens. Uh, oh, do they, do they say? Lords, Go ahead. Lords of Madness, yeah, they... I guess they don't. They say that all of the pieces of a beholder uh, are more are just made of some sort of 
exceedingly buoyant <laughs> matter that just floats. You can cut apart a beholder and its brain will float like a balloon for several hours. And fifth edition goes back to its magic. So it's like they all they all really completely disagree on this whole thing. Um my my question to you is do you have like a I know you you're more familiar with the earlier editions, but do you have like a favorite version of the beholder? Do you do you like the changes, the the fluidity of this? So one of the one of the things I love about what has happened with the beholder is that Every time a new group is in charge of determining what canon is for D and D, they take their favorite beholder and they put the, the premature stamp of officialness on it. When you mix that with the fact <laughs> that we got eighty million different kinds of beholders, and beholders are are sometimes presented as being from different realities and from far space and being connected to Cthulian horrors, I tend to just assume that it's all true for some beholders somewhere, and there is no internal logic. Um, I, I have always liked the beholder as the, the the true aberration, right? The thing that doesn't work the way the world is supposed to work. For a while, in my own games, I was talking about the reason beholders flew was that the closer they got to the earth, the more the earth as the rule of nature and what is right rejected them. So they were literally just being pushed away by how much they didn't belong there. And so it wasn't it wasn't magic in the classic sense. It was a, a bubble of wrongness that, that. Could not, that could not stay too close to something as normal and 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 stable as the ground. And the further they got away, of course, the, the easier it was for them to float about. And then you got Spelljammer where they're in space with their own spaceships. So I, I think especially since I mean We've got beholders as things that have come out of their own dreams, right? A beholder dreamt itself into existence. It has absolutely no actual origin. So I I, I kind of see them as quantum critters. So maybe there was an organ in the brain of one of the beholders that one wizard cut apart because he was observing it. So he was causing it to have to follow certain physical rules by trying to write them down. But that doesn't mean that was true for the next beholder that came along. I love that. I love, I love, I love that idea that you could, um, the beholder creates reality just by thinking about it. Like that's how aberrant they are. So their whole, their whole system changes based on just, what their mood is. Well, and it also, it goes really well with the, the classic extreme paranoia and xenophobia. It's not just that all creatures out there are out to destroy me, but the universe itself does not want me in it. Just the, the laws of physics are opposed to me. It's not just everything. It's not just everyone. It is every instance of everything that exists is trying to make me go away. And possibly they can feel the pressure of that. And even the uh, xenophobia towards its own species. Like, yeah. every every beholder has a different origin and different way that it floats, different way that it reproduces. Because every beholder sees every beholder as something entirely separate. Someone in chat just said quantum beholder will occasionally split into two during a fight and then fuse back into one a moment later. That's the kind of stuff I love to throw into games, right? And just let, if, if you tell players it's doing all this weird stuff and they try and figure it out and eventually someday in the campaign they get to the point where they realize, oh, we can't pin down the rules for beholders because every beholder is defined by what it thinks it is. Also, their stalker, belief don't give John ideas. <laughs> yeah, I'm, re- I'm writing this down right now. <laughs> oh, if, if I'm having a chat with two players and a GM, the players always try and shut me up. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. It's brilliant. It's good stuff. It's terrifying. I'm going to cry when, it, when I have to fight it. But <laughs> Oh, it won't, it won't be in this campaign, probably, most likely. We've already It'll be done in the Magical our... Girl one. Yes, yes. That, oh, that'd be fantastic. Um, so, yeah, we, we do have a couple of questions from chat regarding um, – Black Mamba asked if, uh, does it rely more on its sense of sight and are there limitations to its sense of sight? Um, the, the Lords of Madness actually goes into this. Uh, their sight is exceptionally good. I know, I know Owen had also asked uh, prior to the show, do they have awesome depth perception and what is it like to have 11 points of vision? And, 
Um, the it, it, It's pretty clear that they can see through multiple eyes because Beholder mages will actually blind their central eye. They do this because um, even though Beholder's... I, I guess I should explain a little bit about how the eye works. Let me pull up a, an anatomy oh, picture I here. I love how the eye works. It's so fascinating. The, the main central one or all of them together? All the, of the them. The main central eye. The central eye is the one I'm mostly okay. talking about. But yeah, the, this this is a picture that's popped up here of the, the anatomy of the beholder. And I, I won't refer to it too much because I know we have listeners who don't see the pictures. But um, it is if you want to see this picture, you can get a PDF of the Lords of Madness. And this is on 38 and 39 of Lords of Madness. And essentially, the reason beholders need to suck in magic from the world in order to power their abilities. Um, and there's actually uh, mechanics that do this in the, in the central eye. Um, and they say a beholder's eye does not have a single lens. It has as many as a dozen differently sized and shaped lenses, all capable of independent rotation and movement and linked to the movement of the iris. So by adjusting those, the beholder can aim with its eye ray, it can magnetize things, it can see extreme details, or it can sort of choose how much information it's bringing in. So kind of the answer to all the questions about vision, a beholder sees as well as it darn well wants to. (laughs) Nice. I also liked when I was reading that, I liked that as kind of like they didn't straight up say it, but I think it's kind of a neat way to understand the anti-magic cone. It's not that it's negating the magic, it's that it's absorbing it to power its own magic. And they call this an evocularity. An evocularity actually sucks in the magic and they don't really explain how this works, but it, <laughs> it, the, it's, <laughs> it sucks in the magic from things, literally draining the weave, the magical weave that encompasses uh, the, the realms and other D&D planes and somehow puts that into their brain where they store it in their other organs. Um, and this is why for, for Beholder Mages, uh, they will sometimes put out that eye because before they can learn arcane magic, the the eye has drained it already and it becomes incredibly difficult for them to be able to actually study magic without just draining it and those who want to learn to cast magic in more arcane functions which many of them do because um they'll they'll put out the eye but but many of them do want to learn this stuff because they they uh desire to live forever most beholders and arcane magic is one of the key ways they get there yeah, I mean, it seems like the world should be overrun by beholder liches. You know, oh, you'd, God. Think, you'd <laughs> think that. Um, there's a couple problems with, with beholders and r- ruling the world. Uh, one of them is that uh, the beholders actually don't have an incredible lifespan, not compared to other aberrations like aboliths or mind flayers and elder brains, which just seem to go on and on and on forever. Um, beholders not only get old with around their hundredth year of life, but they also start to get dementia and That's seizures. And awesome. Other- <laughs> uh, taken down by old age. And, also- and, and they're hunted by their own kind. So yes. con- constantly. And so literally everything else, like they, their paranoia is a little justified because <laughs> everything is in fact out to get them. Even if you can't kill a beholder, if you find it, you're going to find somebody who can. Mm-hmm. Well, and when you look at all that, you begin to understand how Xanathar ends up running a, a criminal underworld empire, right? So he can't trust anybody, needs a community. No one will work with a beholder willingly. But if you can strong arm a few guys to be your your face and your voice and and go out and do stuff, beholders are pretty good at strong arming. So setting up a criminal empire seems like a great way for a beholder to operate within a society it itself hates. And when Owen says strong arming, he means ray of disintegration. By yes, the I way. do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like the best. That's the best strong arm technique you got. So I it's love a nice this corporeal form you have there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, one of my one of my favorite things about um, from I Tyrant was actually describing some of these diseases. They even go into the language of the beholders, where they say that um, 
a, a beholder, uh, the, they have suffix to their diseases. The her and er indicates an illness, while the rack and ack suffix indicates a temporary condition. So like the beholder word for it's raining ends with an ack suffix. And so they have certain diseases that are well known amongst them, like spasms, which are dioher, uh, mania, which is eterac. And one of the things I like about this is that um, they call mania a temporary thing, where I think they kind of consistently have it. Like, <laughs> that's a bit it's of a failed of, self-diagnosis. State there. of being. <laughs> well, I mean, every, every beholder must only acknowledge that it has an ailment when its vision of itself is not matched by its current activities, right? So if a beholder ended up being afraid of the dark and it did not realize it had become afraid of the dark, it would not see being afraid of the dark as an ailment or a phobia. That's just a shift in its paranoia because the dark is out to get it. <laughs> um, a, a forgetful beholder has to realize it is forgetful in order for it to think of that as a problem because it always views itself as perfect. Morgan, did you um I know there were some other questions on the chat too. Did you wanna did you wanna throw some of those out there? Yeah. Um Stalker asked a question earlier about um are there stories of beholders being good at all alignment wise? Owen, do you have any stories of good aligned beholders? You know, I have to assume, since there's been a good aligned darn near everything in D&D, &D, that somewhere there is one. Um I actually looked for one a little bit while doing prep for this podcast and I didn't find any. Um, I have a vague memory of a beholder bartender from something, but I can't tell you if that was an, a, an official product or if I'm just thinking of somebody's game from the 1880s, from the ninth, sorry, I'm not at that. <laughs> um, Someone's game from the 1800s. You know what? If you told it to me, Owen, I'd believe it. I'd, I'd say you were there. You were there when it happened. No, the, the only games I'm aware of the 1880s are, are, are Little Wars from uh, H.G. Wells. Uh, <laughs> But I, I, so I, I feel like there've got to be some, um, but. But would it be actually good or would it be more of a neutral alignment, but we see it as good because they're all so consistently evil aligned? Yeah. And that's one of the questions you have to ask yourself. There are a lot of creatures like, you know, when it comes to demons, we can just say, well, a good demon is an angel. Or when it comes to dragons, we've got good and evil dragons. Or even with undead, right? The undead is obsessed with the thing, okay, well, these are Baelnorns. They're, they're actually spirits that protect the Elven Empire. So they're ghosts, but they're good. Um, there's really, there isn't that equivalent for a beholder because one of the central conceits of the beholder <clears throat> uh, is that they are each their own one entity empire. And it's really hard to envision anything like benevolence from a beholder other than possibly as a form of, of genuine madness. Uh, I could see saying, hey, here's a good aligned beholder because it's got a, a, an arrow in the side of its body, which is also its head, uh, which has partially lobotomized the poor thing. And it's had a, a massive change of personality. And now it doesn't dare heal itself because it is aware that if it were better, it would be evil again. Oh God. I love that. That's, <laughs> that's a great idea for, for a character. Uh, that's, that's amazing. Oh, right. Quick secret gamer. Uh, uh, got it. Large Luigi is the closest that we could find which was the non-evil bartender. Okay, so there is a bartender out there. Yeah, from Spelljammer. Oh, oh, that's the bartender. Okay, I, Spelljammer. I didn't find him because he's neutral instead of good, but... Gotcha. Um, okay, that's cool. That's still cool. I'm glad that exists. Um, one of the things that, that people have asked, and, and it was a question that uh, Owen asked as well, is um, do, do beholders poop? And oh god, I, the answer to this question is so horrifying. So I'm actually oh, no. going to work this. This is going to be a special section we're going to do for beholders, and I call this section bad mouthing. So this is <laughs> this is bad mouthing oh, beholders. Oh god, and it's so, a pun. I'm actually going to throw out three things that stuff that happens inside a beholder's mouth is not good. It's things we would not want happening in our mouth cavity. Um, and I'm going to throw out three things that happen in a beholder's mouth. And I want you, I want, I want you guys to rank them for me. You tell me, you tell me which one is the grossest and, uh, we'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll rank them that way. So 
To answer the question first, waste from the beholder is processed in a stomach. Uh, you can see it on the anatomy drawing. It's it's kind of that thing under it's underneath the, immediately the jaw, underneath the tongue, which is really weird. Well, and, yeah, and, and well, for people that are only listening instead of watching, it's worth noting that the tongue is significantly larger than the stomach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I'm just trying to process like how. Like, what does it normally eat? Does it eat, like, anything that it comes across? And, like, how in the heck is that actually processed because of how tiny the rest of the body is? Okay, well, th this is kind of a dual question. I, I can answer this. Um, beholders will eat literally anything that they can put in their mouth and grind up between their teeth. Um, and And beholders eat a wide variety of things. They will eat living things, dead things. They actually love colorful food um that, that one of their few joys in life is eating and they will do it constantly they have a pretty limited sense of taste for reasons that will become clear soon <laughs> uh also we should mention size to help with perspective oh yes uh, yes we should yes beholders are usually roughly eight feet in diameter if I'm not mistaken, and anywhere from two to four thousand pounds, they're large yeah. creatures. Yeah, it is true. In in Lords of Madness, they they mentioned four thousand to five thousand pounds, but I have seen other things that say two thousand. I I've seen one that says the largest beholder, which is a being known as the Hive Mother, was something like forty thousand pounds and forty feet long. Um, so there's that, but that's obviously, a an, an aberration of the aberration, but, uh, but number one on our bad mouthing list, when the stomach is done processing its food, it has no waste hole. So it expels <laughs> it back into the mouth oh. as a slurry. Oh, I, um, hold on. I feel like you got to go through the whole digestion process. <laughs> please. Like, please does, go there, wait, does, that, does that mean there's, please. yeah. Okay. So first it it chews up stuff and sends it to the stomach then it, the what what we would refer to as intestines become smaller and more bifurcated until it's these little almost hair thick tubes that send it into the lungs and then which sounds healthy. Keep which which your, sounds great. Lungs. And then no. their <laughs> lungs apparently mix in the air into this slurry, which is, it gets all of its life-sustaining chemicals in the same way. And then from there, the waste is extruded, as John was about to say, back into the mouth. And then from there, it is either spat out or more commonly, it dribbles out as drool over the course of an entire day. So that so that's number one. Poo, poo in the mouth, we'll call that. Um. But, I mean, I mean, I just I still have questions about how it even manages to eat something because you're like, oh, it chews. None of those teeth are grinding teeth. They're all stabby teeth and there's no lips to keep anything in there. So if it's trying to like chew something, it's just going to fall right back out. Well, no, see that tongue? That tongue will wrap around something and just smash it around inside <laughs> no. until like a giant thumb, it stuffs it down into the stomach. <laughs> if, you imagined, if you imagined you had a balloon and a bowl of oatmeal, you could use your thumb to scoop the oatmeal up and shove it into the balloon without needing any grinding teeth whatsoever. Oh, it would okay. be disgusting, but you're a beholder, so it's all right. <laughs> well, and, and and they do they eat about ten pounds of food and two gallons of water per day it, it, to survive, and they eat about two hundred pounds of meat and several pints of blood in one sitting if they're gorging themselves or wine. They're 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 surprisingly big fans of wine. Yes, yeah, and and you're you're right. Um, they basically uh, they do just shove it down. They don't really care. Um, because their systems are so insane that they will break it up after the fact, or sometimes they'll just chew on it for a few minutes and spit it out if they decide it's not something that can be swallowed. Um, number two on the, on the bad mouth, on the bad mouth list is, uh, this one. Okay. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> this, 
I am now modern worried. modern D and D. I feel intentionally got rid of this. <laughs> I feel fifth edition went a little PG with this and said, "Oh, beholders dream themselves into it. Oh, it's a dream. This is sort of like like new gamers asking how do beholders make mother beholder babies, and and the DM just goes, "Oh, they dream it into existence, honey. Like that's what happens." Um, no, <laughs> the older <laughs> the older. Editions which, of D and D. Which version are you going with? The Lords of Madness version. I think that the Lords of Madness is the perfect um, culmination <laughs> of all prior Beholder lore on this matter. So that's the one I'm going with. There's there's a um, whole geopolitical conversation we can get into on why Fifth Edition decided to have boulders just dream themselves into existence. <laughs> I don't know that we have either the time or the desire to go into it, but I don't know, y'all, for a three hour podcast. Here we go. <laughs> there, are, there are good and appropriate reasons for deciding not to have one of your iconic monsters be something that someone will read about, get nauseated, put down, and never want to read another word you print again as long as they live. So I guess I should start by saying that beholders, um, they, they, they uh, breed through parth- parthenogenesis, is I think how you say that, parthenogenesis, which means that they um, basically self-breed. It's not cellular division like an ooze. It's self-sex. They have both sexes. They, they have both the ability to basically impregnate themselves. And the way they do this is they create their wombs inside their mouth, um, specifically under the tongue. And the growth of the womb actually dislocates their jaw as they grow this egg sac under their tongue. And they just let it grow there and kind of that's where it, you know, does its thing and gestates until eventually they vomit it out of the mouth. Uh, whatever part gets strung up and kind of left in the mouth, they sort of just like ah, chew on it a bit till it goes away. Um, and then it floats in midair uh, until it hatches, at which point they eat most of their young and they eat the womb back as well because delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Can't see why they got rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> that is number two. I will call it uh, mouth babies. Let's call that mouth babies. Mouth babies. <laughs> the, the third, the third bad mouthing item is that beholders, as as Tyler mentioned, they have actually a terrible, um, almost no sense of taste. Uh, maybe because they're constantly, you know, pooping in their mouth, but and having babies in there and all sorts of other things. You, you wouldn't want to taste that. But um, because of this, beholders will sometimes eat diseased or rotten food because their taste buds are so atrophied, and this is one way they can actually get a flavor experience. Now, beholders don't actually get food poisoning. They're too hardy for that. But that doesn't mean that their bodies don't get food poisoning. <laughs> what? So <laughs> okay. sometimes this kind of meal will leave its mark, leave its mark, and uh, they'll form pustules all over their bodies and the insides of their mouths, which will then burst pus all over the insides of their mouth, which count towards their liquid requirement for the day. Oh, so. <laughs> the noise Morgan made is a is a perfect example of why this is not the fifth edition rules. <laughs> I, I feel like also because then you would look at the bite attack and be like, wait, wait, this has to be way worse. <laughs> I mean, it's full of pus and like food waste. Babies. <laughs> like you're clearly yeah, getting no, that poisoned. would be instant gangrene. It, this is what happens when nerds sit around and they think about the fact that a human being is basically a donut. Our shape is a torus, right? There is, in fact, a path all the way through a human without piercing the human. A beholder is a cul-de-sac. <laughs> All this stuff happens in its mouth because all it is is eyes and a mouth. They're, they're, we've seen miniatures of beholders. They don't wear clothes. <laughs> if if there were ear holes even, we'd know it. So uh, you It's know, a they, circle of life. <laughs> uh, and they're, they're evil and hideous, and there is no pro-beholder uh, caucus in the real world. Again, you're, you're not – they they don't represent any real world religion or culture. They're they're not from the Bible. Um, they're just a disgusting thing people made up. So uh, people can can do whatever they want with them. 
And that can be fun if you're into that, but it can also result in an article that people will literally be unhappy that they learned <laughs> these things. Uh, that's great for a podcast where we could all laugh about it and, and people can just go, well, we're, we won't be going into this again next week. But it would not surprise me if you do a Beholderkin podcast, if, if uh, viewership is lower than it is for this <laughs> one, because people don't want to know these things. At this point, with what we did with Abolifs, <laughs> you know, that's, this is this is our reputation now. We're we're kind of one of those like it's so weird, it's horrifying, and you can't look away train wreck kind of things. So it's fine. Don't worry. Yeah. Ah. Uh, so, guys, rate those for me. What do we put in? What are we? Where, is it? What, what goes first? Is it? Is it? Uh, potty mouth with mouth mouth babies or um or uh, oh, tongue pustules? It's it's it, the tongue pustules. That's no. that's number one. Potty mouth has to be the worst. It happens every day. <laughs> right? Just, just, yeah, let me, let me, let me pitch this to you. One of two things is now going to happen to you and you get to pick. Either you will occasionally in your life have tongue pustules or you're going to suffer potty mouth every day. Which of those two things do you avoid? Yeah, I just I mean, avoid horribly rotted food. Yeah, it's got to be potty mouth. Potty mouth is the number one grossest thing on this entire disgusting bad mouth list. Oh, oh okay, okay. So, so babies is on the bottom of that. That's how. That's how far. That's our baseline. I mean, it, so, yeah, it has to be right. If if you have ever been at a farm, or if you've had a cat that gave kittens, right? They right. lick their kittens clean while they're pretty sticky and disgusting. That's, that's true. not that's true. great, but it leads to kittens. And anything connected <laughs> to kittens is cute and adorable. So that at least makes a certain horrific sense. Um, <laughs> it is true that the beholder is unusual in that, yes, sometimes pregnant things have cravings for unusual flavors. And in the case of a beholder, it could be pregnant because it's having a craving for its own pregnancy flavor. And that is much, much, much worse. <laughs> but it's still obviously not as bad as either potty mouth or pustules on your tongue <laughs> yeah i feel like I f well yeah i have no desire to continue down this thread uh, on that note <laughs> we had a question from chat earlier is it edible <laughs> i i actually have an answer to this yeah um, i didn't this get is, to i i didn't get to you read, didn't read this one I, this is, you know, usually we just rely on Tyler's sort of our resident, um, yep. our resident dietitian, monstrous gourmand. <laughs> yep, he, yep. he's tried all sorts of monster meat. I this have, guy, um, and it's and it's uh, it's it, he usually has a pretty good sense of what things would taste like in detail. But for beholders, I tyrant page forty seven actually. TSR actually answered this question for. Me. It's one of the things that they were thinking about back then. Is what what would a beholder taste like? So I, I quote from this, can beholders be eaten? Yes, they can, but they taste extremely bad. I, I would imagine soak. Like there's not a whole lot of meat on a beholder, first of all. They, well, they actually go into detail about the, 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 the texture here. They oh say God. it's uh, it's unusually dense and greasy. Um, it's like an unusually dense and greasy pork. Yeah, uh, I could see that. They, they describe a very specific flavor. They say it tastes it tastes like beef jerky that has been soaked in butter and rubbed with sand. Um, <laughs> which, you know, beef jerky soaked in butter doesn't sound the worst, I got to say. But I'm also picturing some rancidness in this as yeah. well. Um, they do say you can eat it. And the best way to do it is to grind and grind and then regrind and then grind it again. Um, so that you break it down as much as possible and then put it in a meat pie. Yeah, well, that makes... Or if you're an elf, a meat leaf. That makes sense because, I mean, like, you look at those you look at those eye stalks. I mean, they're all... It's going to be all sinew, you know, like... Mm. Oh, no, 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 no. I got to I gotta no, step in here because one average beholder, it's very clear on this, will feed a village of 50. Yeah, and those eye stalks actually probably are a lot like... Uh, the tentacles on a octopus, and those are perfectly edible if a little on the rubbery side. Yeah. One one more thing to note, though, when you are if you are going to feed your village of fifty with beholder meat, you have to do it within twenty um, within six hours because uh, after six hours the beholder completely hardens and petrifies even after being cooked. So Wait, all but, meat, but it takes longer than six hours to digest food. 
Well, you know, that's the that's the miracle of digestion. No. I, well, no. okay, so that explains no. why it tastes so bad because all meat requires an aging process and there's no time to <laughs> age uh beholder meat cuz then it petrifies. It says that if you it actually explains this uh Morganite it says that once eaten you have um 24 hours to pass the meat. Before do you know how many people actually don't do that in 24 hours? I know it's it yeah. Is, you know, so yeah. this is this is worse than eating bubble gum. No, no. <laughs> this I, is almost worse than potty mouth. Now picturing the other end of this, you you know you know that the only reason this came up in an official product is that in somebody's game, someone was like, so what are you going to do now for the poor villagers whose whose village was destroyed by a battle with the Beholder? Oh, we'll just let them eat the Beholder. That's what? Two tons of meat? It'll be great. No problem. And now they'll feast. And the GM's like, no, no, you don't. You don't get to say dropping 4,000 pounds of rancid poo mouth on a village is a good thing. <laughs> and I, I make it official. I don't think you're wrong, Owen, because actually I Tyrant has a number of like facts in it, um, FAQs that uh-huh. go into like it seems like they are directly addressing fans. One of them is about um you don't throw a like, can you throw a blanket over a beholder and thus block all of its eye stalks? And the the answer is you can, and then it will disintegrate the blanket. Yeah. That's... <laughs> but clearly this happened <laughs> to to probably to Gary Guy. That would have to a be a pretty big blanket though. Yeah, it's made by a village of 50 people. <laughs> <laughs> Ready for that inevitable beholder attack. <clears throat> Ready, but not having done any research. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, oh, and you also asked uh, before the, the, the show, you asked if drunk beholders fly upside down, which yep. would actually be more dangerous to a party of adventurers because then they could shoot all their eye stalks off at once, I feel like. That was this was old D and D stuff. Like if you, if the beholder could float you above it, it would then blast you with all ten at once. Yep. Um, but it, it's actually this is this is unknown, and the reason it's unknown is because it takes at least ten gallons of wine to get a beholder drunk. At least that's a buzz. So there's somewhere in the Legolas level of of drinking. We we clearly need to to find a beholder and hook him on the hard stuff, right? Because <laughs> wine is just take, taking too long. So <laughs> it's taking too long. <laughs> Get a couple gallons of tequila in one and see what we've got. <clears throat> I have a few questions left, but I want to turn it over to um, to Morgan and and Tyler. Do you guys have any questions for Owen? I mean, we got my we got the one I really wanted uh, right off, which was any information, any more information on the uh, the creation uh, when when Terry made made it up, like. That's dim and ancient past stuff. So I, I genuinely, I, I like to believe that someone accidentally sliced the head off their plastic cyclops and got some bubble gum stuck on top. But I, I have absolutely <laughs> no evidence that that is true. <laughs> canon. It's canon now. <laughs> We're going to quote it on a wiki. Oh, Owen says. <laughs> um, chat, chat is asking what can be made from a beholder components canonically. Like uh, mage casting items or can you sell any pieces of it? Before it petrifies. I've always thought the beholder eye stocks were great components for rods and one staves, right? Because if you, even if it was going to turn to stone, if I, if this thing used to disintegrate and I straighten it out and have it turn to stone, then what I've got is, is essentially something primed and ready to be a rod of disintegration again. Yeah. I always thought the eye crystals uh, would be something that would be harvested for some sort of alchemical purpose. I mean, or, or even like a sciency thing, like 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 a magnifying like a magnifying glass. Like I wear the eye. Well, and you've I, got this perfect like prism that like each section is a different type of lens. That's super cool. Well, and let's be honest. Just for the pun, there has got to be something beautiful in the center of one. <laughs> I, I, whatever it ate, the, if it ate something beautiful that day, it's there. It's there in the no, center. Because beauty of it. is in the eye of the beholder. It's in the eye of the beholder, oh! right? So it turns to stone. The lenses have to be some sort of diamond or crystal, or that's I love that's, it. that's just a gimme. <laughs> I love it. That is a gimme. All right, Owen. I'm gonna throw this is I I, I this is a uh, the set the Swift Sevens Swift Sevens. I came up with seven quick qu- uh, questions for you. 
Um, I want to just get your fast your fast answers to these, kind of off of the off the cuff, off the top of your head uh, answers. He's gonna put you okay. on the spot. Don't worry I'll about put it. On your no, spot. I'm on the spot. Here we go. <laughs> Are you ready? All right. I'm ready. Whew. Beholder themed cereal. What would it be? Eyeballs. Eyeball. What were they made of? Eyeballs. <laughs> they have no sense of taste, right? And they hate other beholders. So have a big old bowl of eyeballs. <laughs> what would your jingle They're be for the cereal? They're magically delicious. Now, there, there, was that the jingle? That that is the jingle. Absolutely, that's the jingle. All right, you are tasked with entertaining a group of beholders. What do you do? What's your what's your plan? I whisper to the first one that all the rest of them are here to kill it, and then I let them take care of themselves. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that is the greatest spin on a murder mystery dinner party I've ever heard. Um, I uh, a beholder takes you captive. How do you convince it not to kill you? I tell it as I am a gourmand and I can cook a delicious feast that it will find interesting if it just brings me several cows and some cheese and some wine. (laughs) Because it has no sense of taste. I just have to convince it what I'm doing is great. That sort of floats into my next one. You have to cook an Owen family recipe for a beholder. What do you cook? Tongue. That is the only part of the beholder I think that you're going to find any kind of decent recipe for. (laughs) And if they, if the beholder's eight feet long, right, that is like a two and a half foot long tongue. It's a lot of tacos. <laughs> well, actually, you ought to do sashimi because you've only got six oh, hours. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you can just slice it thin fast, get now a that, good jump that, on the entire process. That unintentionally answers a question I didn't mean. What I meant was you have to cook. For, I love that. But you have to cook for a beholder one of oh. your family recipes. What do you do? What do you cook? Um uh, we've got a nice apple crumble, which I will probably make for it, Ooh. but I'll make it a few days ahead of time. So it will have started to rot at room temperature by the time the beholder comes around. Your favorite beholder, I stock power or one you think it should have, if you don't have a favorite. Oh, the anti, that's not, the, that's not an I stock power, is it? Um, no, I, I think it has to be disintegrate, right? There's, there's nothing quite as total as disintegrate. The fascinating thing is that beholders have disintegrate. And other options. Uh, they're, they're almost, they're almost like I, I've got the one disintegrate eye stock, and I've got one that can turn you to stone, which I guess is fine. I have to assume that like the the disintegrate eye stock is the one that gets the nice cufflinks, and they they keep it in the center, and the other eye stocks protect it. Um, because uh, telekinesis is nice because they don't have hands, so I get telekinesis, but. For everything else, it's a it's a ray of cold damage. Yeah, or we could just disintegrate it. Oh, I can tell you, I'm sure they have a lot of fun with the slow spell. Oh just my god! Like, oh, you were gonna I mean, attack me! Oh my gosh! You're gonna hit something with a slow yeah. spell, so you have more time to disintegrate it. And tactically, yeah. I just don't see the advantage. Well, John did something a little different in our fight, where he had us rolling our own doom anytime they turned on us, and for some reason, like Tyler and I rolled umpteen uh, sleep spells, which we were able to avoid, which was amazing. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I guess the only reason a beholder needs anything other than disintegrate is that it might want to eat whatever it hits with an ice stock. (laughs) So the sleep spell, there's a body left. Or if I set it on fire, there's a charred remains. If I use telekinesis to drop it a few hundred feet, then we've, we've got chunky salsa left over. With disintegrate, there's just dust. And your, um, your, your favorite beholder special type, uh, so there's a undead beholder, um, the name of which I am not remembering, uh, but I've always loved the idea of an I undead beholder. I think it's beholder. the death, uh, is it the death gaunt or? Death gaunt, that sounds yeah. right, yeah. The death tyrant. Death, death tyrant. tyrant, that's yeah. it, death tyrant. I, I personally have always liked the idea of a, of a beholder lich, as I mentioned earlier, which I think is, is a, a sadly underutilized specific concept, um. Although, you know, if you're playing 3-5, Green Ronin did have the advanced bestiary, so you can make any kind of undead beholder you want. So you can have beholder whites or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think undead beholders are the things that really, just in case a beholder was not horrifying enough, giving it all those immunities uh, on top of that, as well as not not having to worry about things like breathing. <laughs> and um, my, my, my last of these quick questions is, finally, your cocktail napkin plan to kill a beholder. The one you jotted down while drunk at a bar one night. 
The cocktail napkin plan to kill a beholder is to convince the beholder that it is in fact a clone of itself. And since it hates everything that isn't itself, and it isn't itself anymore, it must, to fulfill its own prime directive, destroy itself. (laughs) And this is why beholders don't rule the world, guys. (laughs) (laughs) Um. I have one more question, but I, again, I want to turn it over. Owen, do you have any more questions for us? On beholders, do you think beholders care about tentacle care, like hair care? <laughs> are, there, are there tentacle creams? Do they worry about skin care? I mean, if they think they are the most important thing in the universe, what do they see as a spa day? Yeah, but but how? They have no arms or anything. Are they going to just, like, charm a whole bunch of, like, peons? Of, like, they just roll up into that village and be like, hey, groom me. <laughs> They've got telekinesis. Yeah, that would, be, that would be a beholder spa day. Just bad spam on the charm person. <laughs> 50 villagers, to be exact. Yeah, 50 <laughs> villagers. I mean, imagine you're you're the player, and you're coming to the village, and they're oh. like, oh, thank God you're here now, because in another few days, uh, uh, Ocular the Beholder is going to show up and demand his mud treatment. Save us. <laughs> I kind of figured, like, <laughs> he would just go to a village, charm them into, like, taking care of them, and then as soon as the charm wears off, eat them. <laughs> Back Diablo Mamba in chat said they can't use head and shoulders because they have no shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's head and shoulder, but they sharpie out the end shoulder. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just head. Disintegrate, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think that beholders are very vain. I think that they do. But the question is, what does a beholder consider self care? I mean, these are right. things that literally crap mm-hmm. in their mouth. So what? What again? Baseline here. What? What is a? What is a good? Okay. Well, you know. Well, tied to that, we already established potentially that beholders create their own realities with themselves by believing it to be so. So why couldn't they just believe themselves to like not poop out their mouths? Because they like it. But do they? <laughs> I mean, I I feel like it's sort of like would you ever? I, I think for them it's like breathing. They just don't think about it. It's like yeah, it's not but something yeah. They, if somebody they can... if somebody were to walk up to a beholder and be like, "Hey, you know, there's a more efficient way to do that," and then they zap think... disintegrate. Oh, okay. Well, I'm... <laughs> yeah, does not fit worldview. What, what you have to do is somehow convince the beholder to improve itself without suggesting that it needs improvement. That's right. the tricky part. If the beholder thing, and just looking at the picture, you notice that its mouth cavity is in its natural orientation a 45 degree slope out, right? So again, it's a cul-de-sac. It, it, anything that goes in has to go out the same tunnel. You gotta, you gotta turn around and make a Yui. Um, so I suspect they, they just the very fact they do things differently than other biological creatures is to them part of their superiority. You poor people have what two nose holes and one mouth hole and one extrusion hole, and you, I do this all with one orifice. I am so much better than you. Mm-hmm. And you and and you actually poop out of out of your bottom. That's so. What is that? That is that is wrong. That's very wrong. Try try it out of the mouth. I have to disintegrate you just for <laughs> offending me. Well, then, what if they're so attached to like if if their tentacles are a vanity? What happens if? To, to a beholder that has lost some of its tentacles in a fight, is it no longer perfect? And ergo, does it deserve to exist anymore in its own mind? I believe that from all the reading I did, beholders believe not only are they perfect now, but they're perfect in every moment of their existence. So everything that happens to them is also part of the perfect plan up until the moment they are defeated and murdered. Yeah, I mean, we know that we know that beholder wizards often put out their own central eye, so mm-hmm. they can't be too precious about it, or they wouldn't give it up for magic power. Right, right, and and once they do that, they believe they have reached the epitome of beholder mm. kind. I, I think it's this central. I mean, if if they didn't have this central narcissism and this central like mania that that made narcissism like the height of their existence, then. I don't know that they could survive because their whole existence is based on believing they are perfect at all times. Well, Owen, did you have any other questions for us? Anything else that, or have we covered 
Have we covered <laughs> the extent of beholders? I, I desperately hope that we have covered everything <laughs> anyone ever wanted to know about the floating death head. There are two things that I liked that we did not get please, to. Please, please. And, and one was the two gods that I found. Yes, they are interesting. Go for the, it. The Great Mother, which as far as I can tell is just the prime beholder, uh, not even a god, is just this crazy beholder that lives in the outer plane. And it's child Gazeminid, the god of gases. <laughs> uh, Figures. <laughs> that I liked. And I liked the, we, I'm surprised we never got into it, the uh, idea that they have two conscious minds that work simultaneously they have a rational mind and an intuitive mind that are two separate yes. identities two separate brains actually two separate yeah. like yeah organs for that yeah it's 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 two separate brains one one does the rational thought and one does the irrational and the two talk to each other very cautiously and that's that's how it remains both able to examine like 6000 possibilities for how people will attack its lair but also not go completely it, well they don't think they go completely insane <laughs> and you know how people are supposed to have the little devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder those are both inside the beholder and they're both devils and they're both devils <laughs> yeah. and they're just both the beholder <laughs> my my last question for you Owen um was have you ever worked on aside from the advanced bestiary or something like that have you worked on like an official beholder product uh for fourth edition uh, d and I did some of the variant beholders in, I believe it was the Monster Manual 2. So those were like the, the Eye of Fire and the Eye of Frost, those things. Oh, right. Um, you said that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that is that is the extent of my official beholder uh, operation. And it was actually a lot of fun because I, I, much as you guys just did, I did delving into previous editions of beholder lore. Uh, and it ended up concluding that for my variant beholders, I could do whatever I wanted. And I that is <laughs> – that is one of the things I think that has led to uh, every edition sort of having a different take is that as soon as you've done that two or three times and then you hire someone, whether they're on staff or a freelancer, I was freelancing at the time, and say, hey, do this Beholder thing. Uh, as long as I don't violate any of the current rules, clearly Beholder canon is pretty far and wide. Uh, and that gives you free reign to kind of do whatever you want. And, and do you think that what they've done with it in – like do you have you read the fifth edition Beholder? Have you yeah. – and what what do you think of the direction it's gone mechanically? Like, do you think that um, you know, moving away from some of the earlier editions, do you feel like it's it's held up? Does it feel still feel like a strong combat and a fun fight? Is I there do. Anything you, you, that's gone that you wish was back. I honestly, I think for fifth edition, they're they're sort of a, a perfect example uh, of how to adapt a concept to a to a a new game system or a relatively new game system. The thing about beholders is that they're, they are such a strong concept that as long as your game rules support that concept well enough for as long as the beholder is going to be on screen in your game, um, the, the art and the concept and the tradition of it is going to carry it through the game. So I don't, I don't get hung up on worrying about specific details of how they are different from they used to be. Uh, because it's still a, an anti-magic eye and a bunch of eye stocks and a horrific toothed creature that that wants to rule or destroy the universe. You don't need a lot more than that to make a game fun. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, um, T Tyler, Morgan, do um, you guys have anything I, else? I think... No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my rational and my intuitive mind, you know, they were... <laughs> They were conflict. in conflict for a moment, they were, they were but now they all agree. To each other. <laughs> and Morgan, do you have anything? Um, uh, no, I'm I'm just digesting what we've learned. Don't use that word. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna. It's gonna take a minute for me to be okay with any sort of digestive processes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Owen. It was a blast. Oh, and thank you so much for coming on. Yes. I, I hope that was uh, as much fun for you as it was for us. I had a great time. So, yeah, make sure you, you all check out Owen. I'll post his uh, 52 project down below again. Just a second here. And I also awesome. recommend checking out his uh, Patreon um, page and also his blogs. Um, it, there's always good stuff coming out of that. And 
he he does a lot. He's constantly working on stuff for his for his patrons. It's it's really fun to be a. I, I'm a patron and. Um, every day I'm getting new stuff um, from Owen. It's like I, it's like having Christmas every day. <laughs> yeah, so the blog's owencaseystevens.com. Most of the articles link to the uh, Patreon if you want to be a patron and help me have the time uh, and willpower to write. I, I write game material for various games, but I also write about the game industry and about the process of being a game designer. Um, I frequently write the things I wish someone was writing 20 years ago when I was trying to figure out how to get into the industry. It's true. It's really true. It's very helpful stuff. Awesome. Well, I think we're going to wrap up here. Um, do we know what we're uh, what monster we're going to be doing next so we can pimp that out a bit? I think is is Freya up next? I think Freya may be up next and that's going to be sometime in December. The date hasn't been hammered out yet, but uh, we'll we'll get back to you. Please do follow us on our uh, Twitter page where we will keep you abreast of all of our upcoming products and stuff. Um, I will say if it is Freya, it will be Shambling Mounds. That yes. will be our next our next monster. Um is the the Shambling Mound. I couldn't believe no one had done Beholder yet. <laughs> it was saved for you. <laughs> that's, that's great. I, I'm I'm delighted, and I think it's it's it. I think we all learned some important lessons about how gross Beholders are. Yeah, I'm gonna stick with my my gut nope reaction. Just you know. Yeah. Turns just out re- you were right. Yeah. A- and remember, it, it's all dream babies. That's really that's really where they come from. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they poop and they poop rainbows. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all so much for hanging out. We love your questions. And um, we will see you again next time. Bye. Bye, folks. Take care. Bye.